Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to this week's Power Up Live. We are glad to have you with us, and uh, we come here every Tuesday on uh, Zoom. Praise Zoom. the Lord, everyone. Oh, I'm getting a little echo on the this week's Power Up Live. Let me we turn are glad that to on. have you with us, and uh, we come here every. There we go. Sorry about that. I get a little echo from the live video feed over on YouTube. We go live on YouTube and from the live on YouTube, uh, we put it over on Facebook. But if you're interested in getting the weekly notifications for when we go live, you will want to uh, sign up on YouTube under my name. Just go to my channel there and hit the notifications button. And, uh, subscribe and hit the notifications and you'll get a notification that we have gone live and you'll know that we're online. So we're here every Tuesday at 12 noon. Glad to be with you today. Looking forward to a great uh, session. Have some things I want to share with you. Bishop Mark Foster is going to be joining us just a few minutes from now. I am here with Bishop uh, Edwin Harper uh, from Huntington, West Virginia. And uh, we're going to ask him to lead us out in prayer, and you'll be hearing from him later on in the in the Zoom call. But Bishop, would you lead us out in prayer? And as we go to prayer, uh, one of our pastors on the call today, Brother Stephen Beauregard, uh, is asking prayer for his wife, three deep vein blood clots that she's dealing with. And so that's very serious. We're going to call Sister Beauregard's name in prayer and then others that you may know of. Bishop, lead us out. Lord Jesus, Lord, here we are. We, love you. we praise you, Lord. We found love you. ourselves thrown into a situation in this world that Lord, somehow, we, Lord, that is just almost mind-boggling for almost all of God, us. And we as we you. move through these, through this maze, uncharted waters, dear Lord, we seek your face oh, and your favor, God. We'll work. knowing God that you are the one that is the pilot of our ship. And we need to release ourselves to you and accept your guidance and your voice and your talking with us and your keeping us. We know, Lord, that without you, that we're a total failure. Oh, oh so God, that we are without ability Lord. within ourselves. The work that we're doing is not based on talent. It's based, Lord, upon your calling and the gifting that comes from you through the presence of the Holy Ghost. It is by that spirit that we even call you the Lord Jesus. And as we, Lord, minister in this gang of people, this great group that is gathered oh, together no, on this that. on this insight for this program today, dear Lord, they're here because they have an absolute hunger for you. And every yeah. one of us, oh, Lord no, Jesus, every no, one of us no, no, needs no, no, no. you to, to get inside of our world and our no, lives, no, no, no. touch our minds, make yeah. us, Lord, able to comprehend yeah, where we are, where we're going, what we're doing. We trust you, Lord. We don't, Lord. we don't have a trust in our flesh. We've found that the arm of flesh lets us down. Oh, but God, your spirit and your presence has never failed us, and it's not going to fail us. And I thank you, God, for the promises of your word. I thank you, Lord, that we rise up and that our help is in you, your loving kindness to us, your gentleness to us, Lord, and how that through you, all things are possible to them that believe. The basis, God, of our walk is believing. And Lord, for each and every one of these precious participants today, I pray, God, that you will take that, that resident innate faith that is in them and help them to open up their understanding to where we are, what's going on, and what our next moves could be. Lord Jesus, let these sessions today cause us to lean on you more oh. and know that, God, you are our present help in a time of trouble. We love you, God, and I pray your anointing be upon my friend, Brother Kleindens, today, and upon our bishop, Brother Mark Foster, and help us, Lord, as we resign ourselves to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, Lord, you know where that this deep blood clot is in this woman. Oh, and dear so Lord, you know how to today, dissolve. Lord, we pray these. So, Lord, I call on your scriptures, and I say, Lord, I passed by and I saw thee polluted in thy blood, and I said unto you, Live, late live. Yea, you said, as you said before, you said it again. Once for heaven and once for earth, I passed by and saw thee polluted in thy blood, and I said unto you, Live, yea, live. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
We believe that that blood clots, multiple blood clots are dissolving right now and health is restored to this precious minister's wife. In Jesus' name Jesus we pray. Name. Amen. 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 Boy, I can feel the power of God as you're praying, Bishop. And I do believe with all of my heart that God is touching those blood clots and touching Sister Beauregard. And uh, all of you that have someone in the hospital or dealing with COVID uh, or an injury or an accident, uh, we continually look to the Lord for uh, the touch of healing. And we are people who believe in the supernatural, miraculous power of the name of Jesus Christ and the power of healing. And we all have our testimonies that we can talk about, that we've seen already. We know what God can do. Uh, our little uh, Everly, our little grandbaby, is still in the NICU. Uh, however, we got some news today that if all goes well for the next 24 hours, uh, they're just on her final watch. They're going to look to maybe let her come home tomorrow. And so we're excited about that and hoping for that. Uh, she was five weeks early. And so now she's going to be four weeks old as of Saturday. So things are progressing good. We appreciate everybody's prayers and we have prayed for her uh, quite a bit. Let me, let me start off today uh, reading to you from the book of Psalm. Uh, chapter 121. It's familiar to all of us. I want to bring it back to your remembrance uh, for what I want to encourage you. Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil and preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. I wanted to read you the whole little eight verse chapter there, but the heart of it for me cometh from verse two. My help cometh from the Lord. Uh, Bishop alluded to it in his prayer. We, so many people right now, for so many various reasons, are feeling vulnerable, feeling weak, uh, in need of direction, in need of help, in need of deliverance, in need of healing. There are the needs seem to be just slightly amplified right now in people's lives, probably because so much of the context and what's going on around us. But do remember, when the earth all around you is sinking sand, on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. And that rock of ages, we stand on the promises of God. And one of the great promises of God for all of us especially those of you that labor in ministry, that are laboring in the word, laboring in uh, shepherding a church, evangelizing missionary work, working in the local church as a youth pastor, minister of music, uh, ushering, greeting, uh, administrative work, teaching Sunday school, taking care of children's ministry, youth ministry, all the various aspects where we are pouring ourselves out and we are trying to be a help. We're trying to help other people. We're trying to speak words of encouragement and words of faith and trying to bring instruction and, and teaching and bring the word of the Lord. And we're praying for people. My wife has her morning uh, prayer call uh, again this morning, every morning in our home, 6 a.m. to 7. There's over 100 ladies that join with her on the phone and they go before the Lord in prayer. And they're an intercession for the church. They, they're an intercession for leaders. They're an intercession for pastors and evangelists, ministers of all kinds and in every area and all the diversities of ministry. And they're praying to be a help to the body of Christ. And so for those of you that are in labor of, of intercessory prayer, you're in warfare, you're, you're in labor of the word, writing books, studying, producing articles, writing things to be a blessing to people. I just want to come on here today and remind you where your help comes from. Uh, your help cometh from the Lord. And we, we lean on our education. We lean on our 
our, our experiences of life. We lean sometimes on our friends uh, for help and counsel and input. There's so many places we reach to for help and assistance and support that there is no source anywhere in the universe like closing your eyes, turning your thoughts toward heaven, and talking to the Lord about the needs that you have. Remembering that your greatest help, your greatest strength, your greatest wisdom, your greatest knowledge comes from the Lord himself. The Lord is our help. He, he is a help in every single area. We often go to the concept in the scripture that he is an ever-present help. I like that part. He's always there, ever-present help. He's never abandoning us, never leaves us. It seems like we oftentimes emphasize in the time of trouble. He's that ever-present help, the time of trouble. And certainly the Lord is our help when we're in trouble. When you have a very desperate need, when you are facing a, an emergency or a crisis, you're in the trial, you're in the persecution or the tribulation of life, and things really heat up, and you're in that crisis situation, surely the Lord is your help. You, you go to him, you, you call out to him. I, I just preached on this, as a matter of fact, just Sunday night uh, at the church I was in here in Florida about the value of seeking the Lord, calling out to God, falling in an altar of prayer, falling on your face. And in the old song, you know, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. So in the time of crisis, in the time of emergency, in the time of great struggle or trauma, there, we do call upon the Lord. We call upon the Lord when uh, there's an injury in our body, there's an accident, there's great sickness or a big diagnosis uh, that has come our way, and we're facing the impossibility of a health situation. We call upon the Lord, but I want to push it past that today, not to discount that, because that is, that is a treasure beyond uh, words that we can call upon the Lord in the hour of our greatest need, because there it is oftentimes that other people abandon. When you become a liability, when suddenly your problems are greater than your contributions, when it seems like you're in more need than you are able to help and supply and lift up, many people withdraw from you. They look to some other direction. Uh, they're looking for someone to help them versus someone they can help. But the Lord never abandons you. In the hour of your greatest need, in the hour of your greatest vulnerability, your greatest weakness, he's always there, but not only in crisis, not only in the time of great need, not only in the valley, not only in the darkness. My help cometh from the Lord. Your help in every area of life. One of the things that has just been rolling in my spirit for the last few weeks is this value of just seeking God in every area of life, seeking God for my decisions, seeking God for uh, who I'm to be talked to, who I'm to be connected to. My wife and I just recently both felt led, and we've started a new uh, area of our ministry and doing some mentoring. Uh, she did a branch off her morning call and is doing a mentoring class with ladies that volunteer and want to be part of that uh, once a month. I just did the first one this past Tuesday. We had 22 that came on that call, 14 pastors, six evangelists, and two local church ministers. And I am offering the years of insight and wisdom, most of which I got from someone else. I'm able to share what Brother Cole taught me or Brother Tenney taught me, men like Bishop Harper here who has spoken to my life for many years of ministry and so many valuable uh, principles and approaches and insights to the things of God. And I have applied them and I have uh, developed them and tried to enlarge them. So when people ask me questions in the mentoring class, I told them, I said, when you ask me a question, you need to understand probably nine out of the 10 answers you're going to get uh, is just the answer that somebody else told me. <laughs> this is what they implanted into my life. And so it's what I'm able to give to you. And I have been, I have been dwelling so much recently on that the Lord is our daily help. He's our daily bread. He's our daily direction. And even in what sometimes seems to be small decisions, uh, but they can have great consequences. 
going to the Lord for direction, going to the Lord for insight. Uh, I do a lot because of the prophetic gifting. Uh, I operate a lot by what we used to call unction, the unction. You feel an urge. You feel an unction. You feel a, a surge. You feel pushed in a certain direction. Some people just simply say, I was led of the Lord. I felt the Lord led me or was leading me. We feel it keeps coming to our mind. The, 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 the instruction just keeps coming maybe several times throughout the day or several times in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. The same person comes to your mind. I called one of our precious elders just, uh, actually I texted them rather just a couple of days ago, said, I've had you on my heart and in my thoughts the last several days. It's because he just kept coming. And then when I would pray for him and then it would come again and I'd pray again and it would come again, that, that let me know that the Lord was leading me to be there. And so I just uh, sent a word of encouragement. But, but this unction will come to lead you in financial decisions. It will lead you in what to minister, what you are to, almost every pastor and minister knows this, that that's how you decide usually what you're going to preach on, on the midweek or on Sunday. You get that unction. You just, some verse just lands in your spirit and there's something you heard or a song you listen to and it just lands there and it's like your attention just keeps coming back to it and you start realizing God is leading me. God can lead you that way with, with it would be in buying a piece of property or selling a piece of property or leaving one job, taking another job, moving uh, lateral positions. You'll get these urges, these unctions from the Lord. It's the leading of God. And I really think there is a tremendous value, probably a much greater value than we even sometimes recognize in trying to be sensitive and follow that leading in that direction of the Lord, even in the small decisions throughout the day, following that direction of the Lord, following that leading of the Lord, and allowing him to speak to us who to call, when to call. One of the things that my wife does, before I go into that, welcome Bishop Mark Foster, glad to see you here. Great to be here, great to be here. Great to be here. We'll be hearing from you in just a few minutes. I'm talking about the Lord is our help. I read from Psalms 121, emphasizing verse 2, my help cometh from the Lord. I've already discussed the fact that the Lord is our help in the most severe. When we're in the crisis, we're in trauma, we're in emergency, we've been in a car wreck, got a diagnosis, big financial problem. He's our ever-present help in those times of trouble. But Amen. much broader than that and much greater than that is just the help and leading of the Lord just in everyday life. Just through the day, the, the, the small decisions of ministry, what to speak on, who to minister to, who to call. I was just getting ready to mention that my wife, one of the things she does very effectively, and I've watched it have so many positive results. So she'll just get somebody will come into her spirit and she'll just give them a call. And her word will not be profound or deep or revelatory in a great way, just had you on my heart, felt to call you, maybe give a little scripture or something. And I've watched so many times that call have such a profound impact on the individual because it was the timing. It wasn't that she said some great unique word from the Lord, is that she just called at the moment when they needed to hear something from God. And so it was a confirmation. And so, uh, these are the things I'm talking about. I want to I want you to go down to uh, Psalm 120. Uh, this is a very valuable insight. And the, the phrase that I love here, I'm going to emphasize, in my distress, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. This is another thing that has been strong in my spirit lately, remembering and being once again encouraged that the Lord hears us. He hears us when we pray. He hears us when we call. He is not a high priest that cannot be touched by our infirmities, but he, he, he has an ear that is ever attent. He's always listening. He's always aware. The Bible teaches us that not even a sparrow can fall out of the sky but that the, and miss the watchful eye of the Lord. How much more valuable are you than many sparrows? So my encouragement today is, the Lord is your help. The Lord is there for the big needs, the small needs, the direction in life, financial decisions, education decisions, career decisions, relationship decisions, who to be connecting to, who to be praying for, 
things you should do, things you should withdraw from, that, that daily leading and guiding of the Lord. But then he is also always listening. So it's not like when you get ready to call upon the Lord for his help, you somehow have to twist his arm. You have to pound heavily on heaven's door to get his attention. The Bible's letting us know that he hears our prayers. He is ready and listening to hear the desires of our heart. Another verse I want to lead you to here, so we kind of broad stroke this a little bit, was very interesting to me. Psalm 34 and 10. I like the language. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. The young lions suffer lack and do hunger. I think the reason that that was pointed out, the young lions, you think about the king of the beast, you think about a lion, especially the young, strong lions. How would a lion ever be hungry? Why would a lion ever be hungry? The lion is the king of the beast. The lion is the ultimate predator. But the Bible said even the young lions sometimes uh, do without, sometimes go hungry, sometimes are in need. But then it said that they that seek the Lord shall not want or be in lack of any good thing. There is a value beyond my ability to even put into words. There is a value and a treasure yeah. in seeking God, going to the Lord in prayer and taking your burdens to the Lord, taking your needs to the Lord, seeking God, seeking him for a word, for direction, for an answer, for insight. When we are people who consistently seek the Lord, reaching for his presence, wanting his help, reaching for his will, his desire, his word in our life, the Bible promises he'll hear the prayer, he'll be our help, and that he will not withhold any good thing. The Lord knows our needs even before we pray, and he is going to be there to answer and, and be that help, that sustenance, that daily bread. You want to call it your daily bread, that daily help. My help cometh from the Lord. We, we all feel it, but really, really we shouldn't, <laughs> but we all do feel weakness, emptiness, lack, from time to time, like we just don't have what we need, but the scripture plainly promises us that if we will be people who will seek the Lord, take our needs to the Lord, take our burdens to the Lord, take our supplications to the Lord, that he is well able. He will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. He is a ever-present help and always ready, always willing help. This, is, this has just been rolling on and on in my spirit. And uh, I, I, I've been preaching on seeking the Lord, the value of seeking the Lord. And then I've been focusing on the fact that the Lord is our help in every single area of life. Wherever area you may feel unqualified, you may feel that you don't really have the knowledge or the strength or the intellect or the money, wherever you feel you're coming up a little short, take it to the Lord. Take that need, take that uh, weakness to God, and you'll find out that the Lord is your help. He can He can w very easily make up the difference, make up the shortfall, and make a way where there is none, and supply everything that we need. Uh, bishops, let's talk about this. Son, uh, you've been going in and out on us, Brother Foster. Are you? You think you're back for good? <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> We're sure glad to have you with us today, your brother. Uh, Brother Tom Foster, he had to do a funeral today right at this time, so yeah. we're certainly keeping him and those uh, good folks in prayer. But I'm talking, uh, Bishop, about kind of several layers here. The Lord is our help. I'm talking about the fact that when we seek God, he has promised to hear us. Mm -hmm. He hears us when we pray. And the fact that He is he's willing and well able. It's not like we're having to really convince God. Mm -hmm. to do these things, to be our help. He actually wants us like a father to children. You know, if one of my sons had a, had a need, 
uh, I'd want them to let me know, hey, what, you know, what's the problem? What's going on? You know, and if it's within my power to help, I'm more than happy to help. And uh, so that's kind of what I'm talking about. You can talk about that unless there's something else that's stirring around in your spirit. Jump in here. Well, thank you, Bishop Klein Dinst. Uh, sorry I was late getting in here. It's kind of been one of those kind of mornings, and uh, but it's been good. It's all good, and uh, so good. The part I got in on uh, that you give, and of course you always give good stuff. Praying for my brother today in the funeral. I've already texted him. We texted today, and then Bishop Harper. Looking forward to hearing from him, and Bishop Kleindienst. I just want to thank you for leading this uh, so well and doing so well on this call. Thank you. Uh, uh, something that was quickened to me while you were actually speaking and the part that I got in on uh, that, that kind of to me sums it up, a scripture that I have leaned on heavily. Uh, it's, a, it's another one of my favorites. You know, my dad had a favorite scripture all of his life uh, or all of his Christian life, I should say, uh, he came to God when he was 21 years old, uh, playing football for the University of New Mexico and had had actually uh, been through the, the military uh, in World War II in the Navy. But uh, a favorite scripture of his, and it's even in his Bible college yearbook is his favorite scripture, was Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, that's another one of my favorites, but mm, I've got several favorites. And uh, so one of my favorites that the Lord just kind of spoke to my heart while uh, listening to you, Bishop Kleindienst, is Psalm 138 and 8. And I have leaned on this one heavily uh, for many, many years. And it says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. This is the psalmist mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. And so he's reminding the Lord that I am the work of your hands. I am, And it doesn't hurt to talk to the Lord that way. I am the work of your hands. You created me. Uh, the psalmist said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made because I was created by the great creator, the creator of all things. And then he said, your mercy, Lord. He's reminding the Lord again. We're kind of going backwards here in the scripture, but he's reminding the Lord again, your mercy, oh Lord, endures forever. Your mercy is forever. And then again, I'm reminded of that reminds me of the scripture that, that the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Mm. Every morning, he cares so much. He's going to help me. I'm going to seek him. And a part of my seeking him is reminding him that I am the work of his hands, reminding him of where I am. And he knows, right. but, but he likes to be reminded. He likes for us to talk to him. And, and then I, I also remind him, Lord, your mercy. Your mercy endures forever. Your mercy is forever. And of course, uh, the, the scripture says, you know, and there's a song from that, great is thy faithfulness. But then we come to the first part of that eighth verse of Psalm 138. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. The Lord is concerned about what I'm concerned with. The Lord is concerned about what I am going through. And so the Lord is going to take care of those things that concern me. And, and, and then just to carry it a little further uh, and, and kind of in the vein that we talked in last week uh, and that you so capably led us in there, Bishop Klein Dance, what it was is, is the fact that a grateful heart produces a harvest. Mm. And so if I can live a grateful heart, I just read this morning that my thinking can actually change the structure of my brain. 
ah. the way I think. And so if I can so form a habit of gratefulness, of thankfulness, of praise, some folks are in the habit of complaining. Some folks are in the habit of griping. I call it mully grubbing. My mother always called it mully grubbing. Put your mully grubbing, Mark. <laughs> and so, so if, if I'm always down in the mully grubs, if I'm always mully grubbing, griping, complaining, moaning, groaning, and I choose to look at the bad, then my brain's going to be shaped that way. However, I have chosen. I made the choice way, way back there. I was raised in a very positive home by very positive parents. And I made the choice that I'm going to live positive. I'm going to live grateful. I'm always going to see the glass as half full, not half empty. Bad things happen to good people. That's a, the, the scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust. So bad things happen to me, but I still know that he's concerned about me. Right. I still know that he cares about me. God is going to perfect that which concerns me. He's going to take care of that that concerns me. So if I can begin to live that kind of life and start looking at the good rather than the bad. I, I'm reminded of when Paula and I went to the East Coast back in February of 1981 to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to raise up a church there. And uh, we actually slept on the floor the first night or two in that little church, that little bitty office, little little heater plugged into the wall all with a pallet for us and our boys. And, and then, then we bought a trailer, probably I think it was 14 by 70 maybe, something like that. And uh, it, it had bullet holes in it. It had screens that were dangling. It had paint peeling to the bare metal. And of course, we, we fixed that and worked on that. And, but we lived in that little trailer. We were raising our boys in that little trailer. And we felt so blessed. Amen. Paula and I were talking about this this morning. We moved out of our dream home. We had just bought our dream home three months before the Lord moved on us to start evangelizing. And so we were assisting my dad. We bought our dream home, backed up to some woods, nobody behind us, beautiful home there. And so three months after living in it, we sold it, hit the evangelistic field. The next home we lived in, now we had a couple of travel trailers. One of them got stolen. I don't have time to go into that today, but one of them got stolen. Uh, after I was preaching a camp meeting on the Texas district camp or uh, youth camp, I should say, but, but the next home permanent home that we lived in was a travel or, or a trailer old trailer with bullet holes in it and, uh, and carpet that was as thin as a little piece of cardboard. And we, there we were, but we were so happy. We were raising up a church. We didn't have two nickels to rub together, but we felt like God was taking care of us. We felt like God cared about us. We felt like God had placed us there, and we thought that was the greatest place in the world to be. That's the way we looked at it. That's the way we, 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 we didn't have the, you, you know, we didn't have, my mother would say, my dad was, was his nature was, he never sent us an offering except one time. And it was actually intended for somebody else. And the district secretary called me and that person had actually left North Carolina, come to start a church, didn't last, had left. Dad had sent them $600. And uh, so the district secretary called him back and said, what do you want me to do with this? You sent it for me to send it to so-and-so. And he said, well, just send it to Mark. I know his baptistry is leaking and he's been talking about buying a baptistry liner. Maybe he can buy a baptistry liner with that. That's the only offering my dad ever sent me. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't complain about that. That helped make me who I am. Now, a lot of folks felt like 
Uh, and, and, and I couldn't help this because I, I was born into this family and I, I loved it. I'm so glad I was born into the family I was born into. And because dad pastored a great church, they thought that dad was sending me offerings all the time and actually supporting me. And I, I wasn't trying to track people down and tell them any otherwise. I was just happy where I was. My mother would send us $10 and, and she would write a little note that have a $10 bill in it. And it said, dear Mark and Paul, you know, she'd talk about that and it said, here's $10 and it said, go buy some round steak. She knew that I loved fried round steak. And today I love fried deer steak. Come on, somebody. But she would say, go buy some round steak. Then she would say this, keep it under your hat. <laughs> keep it under your hat. Now we knew what that meant. That meant don't tell your dad. Okay, because dad's philosophy was, Mark, if God called you, God is going to keep you and God is going to take care of you. And that's exactly what God did. Living in that little trailer with bullet holes, we felt so exceedingly blessed. And we felt like God was taking care of us, and he did. I, I don't have time today, but I could tell you story after story of offerings that came in the mail, of people that just walked in and dropped money in the plate. Uh, I, I could tell you, and, and, and if my dad had been supporting me, I wouldn't have the opportunity to tell those stories. I wouldn't have those stories. So you've got to feel blessed and grateful wherever you are today. Whatever your circumstances are today, know and understand he cares about you. That's and right. so I seek him and I reach for him. And at the same time, I praise him and I magnify him because I am his child and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's blessing me in whatever it is I'm going through. Woo! I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Love. Hey Amen. Jump in here, Bishop Harper. This is a good flow we got going here today. Talking about the provision of the Lord, the help of the Lord, the guidance of the Lord, the love and mercy of the Lord. Let me read you uh, something very, very familiar to all of us. Matthew 6 chapter, starting at 26 verse. Behold the fowls of the air, for they neither sow, neither uh. do they reap nor do they gather into barns. But your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are not you much better than they? Which of you can take thought to add one cubit to your height? Take no thought of your raiment. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So he says, take a look at the grass of the field. Uh, today is, tomorrow is cast into the oven. But shall not he do much more clothed of you, O you of little faith? Uh, let me take you back to creation. In creation, on the, on the uh, fourth day of creation, let me make sure that I'm saying this right. Uh, I think I, I think it's the fourth day. Let me just reel back here to the book of Genesis real quick and take a look at it. So anyway, here, here's the thing. It was um, it was the um, uh, let's see here. Yes, it was the fourth day of creation when the Lord called the earth up out of the water. It goes on to say that then he said to the earth, I want you to bring forth fruit. And it brought forth grass. And so what I want to tell you is this, is on the fourth day of creation, God created the land. And on that land, on the fourth day of creation, green things begin to grow. Of those green things that began to grow on the fourth day of creation was the lilies. Now, I tell you this for a reason. And then on the fifth day of creation, 
it says that he created the fish in the sea, but he put the fowls in the air. Isn't it amazing that first was the lilies, then was the fowls, and on the sixth day, he created you and me. Now, when he created you and me, the Bible says that we, he almost created us in the form of an angel. And in the creation of man, you're almost an angel. Now, I say all that to you to say this. In when the temple of, of uh, was created by the man by the name of Solomon, and he built the temple, the Lord gave him specific instruction how to build it. And that was, of course, there were some pillars that were put there. But the Lord specifically said that at the top of those pillars that he put lily work. Mm -hmm. Isn't it also interesting to know this, that noted among that lily work that was carved into those great monster columns that were there was also a place where the, the sparrows gathered and built their nest. Now listen to this. Then Solomon said this, he said, if anybody comes into this house and they offer a petition, hear them from heaven. So take note of this. Down at the altar in the temple, there kneels a man asking a petition of God. And when God looks down from heaven at earth and he looks down, the first things he sees is his lily work. The next thing he sees is the sparrows. And the next thing he sees is the petitioner on his knees at the altar. Beautiful. All of that sequence that above there becomes a constant reminder even to God. If I'm going to take care of the lily and if I'm going to take care of the sparrow, I'm going to take care of the petitioner that's down on his knees there. Wow. You can make it assured of this. Anytime you go before God, God has already made his statement of contract to us. And it's rather interesting the things that he sealed the contract with. He, or, he made it ornate with the lilies. He made it a habitat for the birds. But then he wrote his signature in the contract of our care in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, whether it was healing out of the stripes on his back or salvation for our soul or the provisions for leading, I want you to know something. The Lord's going to take care of us. Amen. When you turn to him, our help is in that one that has such security for us. And that security for us. In fact, I heard a man say something the other day. I was sharing with him the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, and I won't go into it today. Someday we'll get into it and I'll talk about it. But as we begin to go through that, one of the scriptures says, if God be for us, who can be against us? That being the case, with all that is done with the foreknowledge of God, the predestination, the, the uh, call to uh, uh, justification, uh, the call of God, the justification and the glory of God, we were talking, and he made this statement. He said, when I read these scriptures, he said, it becomes very, very obvious to me that if somebody who once has been born again goes to hell, they've got a real job on their, on their hands to get there because God has made so many provision to take care of us as human beings in our failures, in our shortcomings, Amen. in our humanity, in the walk that we have, the temptations that we face, the battle that we fight. And sometimes even when our faith is challenged, he rises up to remind us that I put the faith in you. And until I take the faith out of you, I'm going to make sure I take care of you. The resident faith of God that is in us. And somebody said this one time, they said, how do I know that God still has something for me to do? The old boy looked at him and he said, I'm going to tell you how you know. If you woke up this morning, that means God's not finished with Woo! you. That's right. And so understanding then that kind of analogy about the grace and the keeping power of God, we can keep turning ourselves back to him, checking out our spirits with him, checking in with God, and just listen to the Lord. Listen. 
the same voice, the same voice that speaks to you about what you're going to preach in the next service where you're going to the pulpit is the same voice that God speaks to you and gives you direction. His word, his voice, and the impressions that he puts you in the spirit. God's going to take care of you. Uh, this is so true. I love these beautiful, colorful analogies you bring. And the scripture is so poetic and powerful in the way that it presents it to us. And as I was listening to both of you give your inputs and impartation, um, it reinforced something in my thinking that's been part of this whole process. If we are, it, it's like anything else in life. If we get disciplined and, and get a, in a habit and get in a lifestyle of depending on the Lord for direction, whatever it may be, you know, uh, you, you will remember some of the old timers, you know, no matter what you would tell them, Hey, see you tomorrow. They say, Lord willing, you know, Lord hey, willing. we're together for dinner this afternoon, Lord willing. Lord willing. In other words, even the smallest of decisions and schedules, there was this consciousness and this mindset that it was based on the direction of the Lord, the will of God, the desire of God, God's leading hand. Nothing was done. Every single thing was done uh, with a consciousness of God's involvement in it. Yes. And, and here's one of the reasons I think this is so critical right now is if we get in this habit of doing that, just lifestyle of just depending on God for basic decisions, little ones, big ones, every area of life. I'm getting a lot of calls as probably you pastors are as well. You know, what's going to happen? How bad do you think it's going to get? What pressures are we going to face? You know, how far into the end time are we? And, you know, what are, what kind of challenges are we going to see? But there's people are really getting concerned as to what level of hostility might, might we face as the people of God, as Christians, as the church? What obstacles might we face? But, but the point is, if we learn to trust God when we're not in a crisis, when it's not critical, when we're not in a valley, when those moments come, we'll just right from that platform know exactly what to do. It'll be intuitive. It'll be automatic. I don't think you'll go into a panic. I don't think all of a sudden you'll be shattered. You will do what you know to do. I, and this is really what came to my mind. This is, this is what I'm trying to express. I, a few times in our lives when we were really, really up against it. I mean, my wife and I were facing some very nearly felt impossible, didn't know how to negotiate what to do, how to respond, which way to go, just seemed like there was no real way. And, and of course, when you're in those situations, your spouse, you know, that love of your life becomes that, that, that close, dear confidant. You talk to one another about these things and and there's those moments, and I can remember us laying in, in the darkness at night, laying in the bed at night together in the darkness, getting ready to go to sleep, just talking. And, and we would come to the conclusion, you know, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to approach this? Well, well we're, we're just going to lean on the Lord. We're, we're just going to trust the Lord. In other words, our entire lives have been based on trusting God. And just because it's gotten critical now, doesn't mean we're going to panic and think there's some other help or direction. Our help comes from the Lord. Amen. So we're going to trust God. I think it becomes the natural automatic response to trouble. If right. you learn to just do it always. And I might say this, it's good preventative medicine to just be trying to listen to the direction of the Lord. You might keep yourself out of some right. troubles of your own making. If we get God to tell us, uh, you know, at least in the major financial decisions, major moves, major ministry moves, you know, you don't just go and do something, but you seek God for right. his help. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to this and we have a few more minutes to get some final comments here. But um, I found out that God, when God's will is involved, where God guides, God provides. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that I've employed that in the past is with my overseas crusades. When I, when I was invited somewhere and I was trying to pray about, you know, God's will and God's desire, should I go there? Should I take this trip? Um, I always had a little gauge in the back of my mind. If the money started coming in, if people started giving toward that crusade, wanting to assist me to go, 
I would view that as God's provision. This is God's will. God's making the way I'm going to pursue. If I had a meeting coming up and no money was coming in, no finances were arriving, I was trying to figure out how am I going to get this done. I began to take a pause and say, you know, the Lord's not providing for this. Uh, at least he hasn't yet. So maybe I shouldn't go. I've had two very pronounced situations there. One, I was getting ready to go to Pakistan and we were right down to the final day. My wife had the ticket on hold, but it was a 24 hour hold and we were, the clock was ticking and it was the next day. And we had like a few more hours to that evening and it was going to go off a hold. And basically that was it. And she called me and said, you know, that ticket's only on hold till tonight. And uh, I didn't have the money. And I was in a mall up in Michigan with a pastor and he had to go, uh, get something for his wife. So I just sat there in the food court for a few minutes and I was just waiting on him. When I'm sitting there, my phone rang. And when I picked it up, there's a pastor on the phone. He said, Brother Klein, I've just had you on my heart today. Um, do you have any crusades coming up or any mission trips? I said, well, yeah, I'm supposed to be going to Pakistan as a matter of fact. He said, well, how are you doing on your finances with that? I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm supposed to buy the ticket today. And he said, well, I feel like the Lord prompted me to call you. You know, I wanna, I wanna help you and basically provided the money that day to buy to go to Pakistan. So I took that as a sign from God, the Lord had provided. I had another trip uh, to Papua New Guinea a few years ago, and it was, the, it was the most profound thing. I used to go to Papua New Guinea with Brother Cole, hadn't been in a number of years, and I was really excited about going, going to it. But um, I was in a church service, and I was gonna mention the trip to Papua New Guinea, and mention it to the pastor that if they felt led to support. And when I was easing up on getting ready to mention it, I felt the Lord check me. And the Lord literally spoke into my spirit, do not mention this trip and do not ask anybody or call anybody anywhere for any finances on this trip. Well, now I'm thinking, now how in the world am I going to get the money for a trip if I don't even tell people I'm going? <laughs> that people to give as they so see fit. But the, the most phenomenal thing happened. The Lord restricted me from even telling about that trip. And more money came in for that trip than any missus trip I've ever taken in my lifetime. And I never brought it up in a church service. I never called a pastor and asked for money. It was ne I never brought it up. People just started giving to it. Pastors started giving, asking me where I was going. So I feel like the Lord wants me to help you with a trip. Where are you going? And so the Lord was showing me his provision. Final comments here, bishops. Back to you, Bishop Foster. We're going to pray. Oh, this is so good, Bishop Clyde Dance. And uh, I, I think it's just what, what you said about God providing He'll make a way if, if it's his will to do so. And, and, and you waited on that Pakistan trip. It was just a few hours away till the ticket was going to be gone and you weren't going to be able to go. And God provided. Uh, I, I'll never forget going back to our days in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We went there strictly by faith. We had, we, and, uh, it's a story maybe I'll have time to tell some other time, but we had we we were actually going to uh, assist for a year and then become the pastor of a of a great church, which we didn't feel we felt a real when we walked in there we felt it till we rolled into town, and then all of a sudden we didn't and I had already been contacted about Winston Salem, and so we went there strictly by faith they could not pay us uh, they could not give us a nickel because they didn't have enough money coming in to pay the church bills. Mm. And no one had, it was just a little handful of folks. There had been no misappropriation of funds because there simply were not funds to appropriate. And so we, we told God we were gonna go there by faith. And my dad even argued with me, told me I need to get a job. And I, I told him that God had spoken to me clearly to not get a job. Now, I don't recommend this, uh, you know, but God had spoken to me to not be a bivocational pastor. And so I said, Dad, I got to follow God. And he looked at me and he said, if you've got the grit, go do it. And uh, God, there's story after story. I, I, rem I remember one Wednesday, we had a church note due and the church note was almost $800. 
and uh, and it was due. And we, we couldn't even write a church check when I got there. Of course, we got beyond that. So I, I don't have time to go into that. But I told Paula, she said she was so worried. And she said, Mark, what are we going to do? I, I said, babe, we got church. It's Wednesday. We got church tonight. And she looked at me and she said, you forget that I take care of the finances of the church. And she said, I know that we usually average 10 or $12 in the offering on Wednesday night. And I said, babe, God is going to supply. And I got to church early that night. I got a no knock on my door and somebody handed me an envelope and they said, I want to pay tithes. And in that envelope, was enough to make the church payment. Now, they didn't make that kind of money. They'd had an insurance settlement and they paid tithes on the insurance settlement. So when my wife walked into the office before church, she got there after I did. And when she came in the office, I was just smiling. And I said, remember what you said today? I said, yeah. I said, I pulled that envelope out of my, out of my pocket and, and I handed it to, to her. And I said, take a look at this. But God did that time after time after time. God always provides. And, and I praise him for it. I want us to go into prayer. I feel very strongly. It really wasn't the full intent of my thoughts when we started out today. When I was talking about the help of the Lord, it's really thinking in, in direction and wisdom and insight. But it seems like the spirit has led us to a place here. I feel a prophetic word. Uh, somebody listening to us out there, a pastor, a minister, a missionary, they're, they're, you're facing an impossibility. It's beyond you. It's out of your reach. And I feel like God has put these scriptures in our hearts and these stories to tell, to encourage you and to tell you to have faith in God. God's going to supply. God is going to make a way. Bishop, one of the great lessons that I've learned about this thing called the work of God mm. is that in business, you can, you can speculate what your income is going to be, especially if you're in the utility business. Those companies can create a budget. Insurance companies can create a budget. Banks can create a budget. You can create a budget for your church work. But I'm going to hear, I'm here to tell you something right now. It is impossible to budget faith. Yeah. We are working Amen. with a different financier when we are working with God. And somebody out there today is having a real financial challenge. I believe it. But I am telling you right now. Amen. That you need to rest yourself in the expediency of the Lord. Woo! That he has never failed. And if you will be faithful with what God has given you, and you will and you will be faithful with your giving, your support, your work, your love for the kingdom, your faithfulness to the righteousness of God, you hear me tell you, just as sure as there was a fourth man in the fire, and that there was an angel that locked the doors of the lines and the Yes. In Daniel's lion's den, and just as sure as the Lord rolled back the Red Sea, stopped the Jordan River, multiplied the widow's cake of oil and, and, and meal, and, and multiplied the oil for that woman that was about to lose her sons and heritage, you just write it down. We have too many evidence to understand uh -huh. that you cannot you cannot budget faith, but Praise you have God. to accept God as the sufficient all in all. And nobody can ever doubt the fact how gracious God is and how merciful he is and how he supplies so many needs. Remember something. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold in the hills and all the taters in the hills. Mm -hmm. He is the master, if you please, of of financing his work. And yes. so it is. You cannot budget faith. God, right now I pray and I release, Lord, the yes. divine provision 
the miraculous supply. Let the, let the oil be multiplied. Let the meal be multiplied. Let the bring the meal, Lord. Lord, let the rock bring forth water. Lord, let the manna rain from heaven. Lord, all the miracles and all the power and possibilities that you have. Lord, cause it to come, Lord, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Cause men to give into our bosom, Lord. Meet the special need. Meet the impossible possible need that some brother sisters facing that's going to be listening to this and watching this Lord I'm asking you Lord for a miracle provision Lord open up the windows of heaven pour out that blessed Lord show yourself strong and mighty your arm is not short your promises are not short. you are the great supplier Lord you're the great provider you are our Jehovah Jireh today Lord I declare it I release it I speak a prophetic word of divine provision over every ear that hears this voice right now in the name of Jesus, I speak now that the Lord your God shall provide. He'll make a way yes. in the wilderness. He'll bring streams in the desert. The Lord yes. is going to provide. In the name of Jesus, I speak it right now. A miracle is in the making. It's, it's transpiring. It's unfolding. I feel it stirring right now in the invisible world. Lord, bring it into the hands of your people. Touch <laughs> Lord, those churches. Hallelujah. Touch those ministers, Lord God, everyone is in vulnerability today, that it feels in lack today, that feels an empty hand, oh God. I'm asking you, Lord, to let it come pressed down, shaken together, running over. Supply the need, Lord. Be the provider, I pray, in the mighty name of the Lord I Jesus know. Christ. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Woo! Such a strong and powerful witness of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That the Lord is going to provide. Yes. I know we like him to do it early, but he's an on-time God. He may not be too early, but he will not be too late. He's going to be on time every time. Every time. I was listening to a song the other day. It kind of fits right here. They were singing about Lazarus. Said, isn't it great that even when he's four days late, he's still on time? Still on time. <laughs> He's an on-time God. I love Amen. you. Thank God for you. Thank you, bishops, for your impartation and powerful, powerful ministry and word today. We'll be back here again next week. If you want the notification, go to the YouTube channel, hit the subscribe and notifications, and I'll let you know as soon as we come on live. God bless you. Love you. See you next week. Love y'all. Thank you.